everyone and welcome to the first episode of the knowledge show powered by knowledgecape my name is ahmed zaman and i will be the moderator for today's discussion to set a context for all the viewers out there the knowledge show is an initiative to bring the perspectives of leaders across different walks of life throughout the globe on matters related to business technology learning and life in general the discussion in today's episode will be around the theme ensuring a positive work culture through dei and without further ado i would like to take this opportunity to introduce to you our guests first up is rajiv jairaman the founder and ceo of nolscape nolscape is the brain child of rajiv jairaman a man who likes to don many hats he is a theater artist a singer an engineer a doting father to his two children and ceo at nolscape he founded nolscape at ncr and has nurtured it into leading player in the field of talent transformation rajiv firmly believes in being a lifelong learner and is keen on revolutionizing the modern workplace thanks rajiv for joining us and giving us your time thanks amar delighted to be here on the show a special guest for today's show is freda liu freda is a powerhouse communicator and connector freda is a global speaker author broadcast journalist mc moderator and trainer she believes in the concept of revolving to evolve a journey she personally embodies and imparts to others through her books and her work freda has written six books namely life is a stage stories of an empowered life pr yourself shake and spear your business the romeo and juliet way and everybody loves ray it's a biography bursting fixed mindsets and in your skin welcome freda to the knowledge show thanks ama and nice meeting you rajiv interesting singer and engineer i'm still <laughs> i'm still thinking there yeah great to be on the show with you freda you too so as a format of this show before we move on to the more serious discussions i would like to play a game i know uh, karan johar but uh, rapid fire is my favorite a uh, segment of all shows that i do so it's a rapid fire question and we will have a winner at the end of uh, oh this my god <laughs> uh, depends on who has more interesting answers to <laughs> give right so rajiv will go with you first it's like a would you rather segment and your first question is would you rather write another book or act in a movie well i i'd like to write a book that gets adapted into a movie in which i'm the star <laughs> wow <laughs> that's you what you call a visionary leader <laughs> a beach or mountains beach or mountains i, I would uh, pick both california is my answer where you get the best of both worlds nice would you rather see the future or change the past i'd like to be in the present oh interesting <laughs> very nice okay would you rather give up air conditioning or internet for the rest of your life ah that's a tough one <laughs> i think i'll give up i'll give up air conditioner oh not the internet right a last one for you would you rather become omnipotent or immortal wow that's a tough one mm. i think i'll go with uh, maybe omnipotent and and why would you choose that because i i feel as um, souls we are immortal ah oh, uh, or maybe through the work that we do we we do leave behind some legacy so that way you know we we continue to have an impact on the world around us mm-hmm. very nice very interesting answers rajiv how do you beat those answers right <laughs> <laughs> exactly so you have a tough competition freda mm. we'll come to you uh freda would you rather write another book or have someone write your biography i think write another book my life oh. is not that i mean it's okay but it's not, you know write another book. i think there's a lot more that i'll be able to learn and will be able to share 
So yeah, I think you know, I can write my book. Ooh, okay, no. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. So feminism or gender equality? Huh? Who? Feminism. Feminism, because I mean, we're all working towards gender equality, right? So feminism and something that everybody should have, and when you have that belief of feminism, you will achieve gender equality. Right. Okay. The next one is have bland food every day or spicy food for the rest of your life. Spicy food for the rest of my life. <laughs> I was I was in India for three. Weeks breakfast, lunch, dinner, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great power to have. Yes. Okay, so the next one is unlimited battery in your phone or permanent Wi-Fi access, no matter where you go. Oh, oh, uh, permanent Wi-Fi wherever I go. <laughs> battery, you'll sort out the issues. You'll find a way. You'll find a way to recharge. Don't worry, but you want, you need Wi-Fi. Perfect, perfect. Okay, the last one for you in this segment. Uh, would you rather be on a three-year sponsored vacation to your favorite place, or never get tired of working throughout your life? Oh no, I need a vacation. Three years. Ah, oh, you know, you enjoy three years. You'll come back refreshed, ready to go. So, a holiday will be nice. Fully sponsored. I think that was the key word. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. I think I think we have had really interesting answers from both of you. So I don't think I can decide the winner here. But whenever we do uh, launch the episode and release it, we will ask for a poll. Sure, that works. Yeah. <laughs> um, getting back to a theme for today, uh, around which we will have, we will be having this discussion. So it's it's about positivity and you know uh, building it through workplace culture and all of that. So we have had a lot of discussions and narratives around positivity and healthy work culture, right? But how do we actually measure positivity? Is it just a vibe or a feeling that you get? Or you have certain parameters in mind that, okay, if these things are being met, maybe I'm in a positive environment or a positive work culture. Rajiv, would you take that first? Sure. Um, so before I get into the measurement of uh, positive work culture. So let's try and understand what are perhaps some ingredients. So once you break that down, maybe we'll find a way to measure them. Uh, to me, a positive work culture is one that provides psychological safety, where mm -hmm. I'm, I'm able to be authentic, I'm able to be myself, and I don't feel judged or discriminated against. So to me, that would be um, one of the ingredients of a positive culture. And then um, along with that goes the idea of inclusion. Right, because if it's psychologically safe, I feel included, and maybe I'll feel a sense of belonging. As humans, we are all social beings. Um, I think that sense of belonging to any organization, or to a group of people, or to a community, that is an integral part of our identity. Uh, right, and so I think that's an important element as well, how uh, we feel a sense of belonging. And once those basics are met, and, and then comes uh, the ability to connect with each other, to have healthy relationships, be it with your leaders, your managers, your, your peers, the relationship angle. And uh, beyond all of this, I think individually, every one of us uh, wakes up in the morning not to do lousy work, right? We all want right. to do right. bring the best version of ourselves. Are we able to perform and become the better a better version of ourselves, right? And is that workplace allowing us that opportunity? So just to summarize, I would say if we can measure how psychologically safe we, people feel, how included we feel, and uh, are we you know, feeling a sense of belonging? And to that, I would add the relationship quotient and the achievement quotient. So uh, I, I think if you are able to measure these, I think it would point in the direction of a positive workplace. Right. I was going to say everything that Rajiv was going to say, but no. But seriously, the whole, the whole, the whole aspect of psychological safety, I think, it's so important right now, right? When you are, uh, I was just reading a book by uh, the, the the woman who started a mogul out in the U.S., and she was saying that how do you, how do you, you want your employees to feel uh, that they can bring all of themselves right to to the organization i should be the same person when i'm at home i should be the same person when i'm work so do i feel psychologically safe 
Am I do I feel free to speak up about certain things? I mean, you know, of course, obviously not to be in a rude way or whatever, but I can I can truly be myself, right? And I think organizations that are flexible, organizations that understand that people have changed, needs have changed. Um, when you talk about measurements, I, I'm just thinking, what are the telltale signs? Maybe um, I'm sure organizations do it, employee surveys, right? But don't do it in annual uh, annual survey. Right, you, we do. We've all done these surveys, and you know, and we've done do these surveys, and you don't know what gets done. Maybe you want to look at it quarterly, so you have a real gauge of what has changed, what hasn't changed, and what needs to improve. And of course, over a year, this is what we see. But then you always want to get a pulse of what your employees are doing. And I, I, of course, maybe there's something that's required in larger organizations for smaller organizations to employees feel comfortable. Now, the other way of measuring, which is probably the last way of measuring, is attrition, right? What's the percentage of people who, who have left the organization compared to other people in similar industry? Or what is just like, wow, if, you know, it's, if, if it's more than 10% of the whole company is leaving, it's, it's probably at the end of the road already that you've got, you know, or whatever the industry average may be, right? It's probably a little too late already because that's the that's already I've, I've given up, right? And, and of course, you know, we talk things about the great uh, resignation, the great awake, reawakening, that sort of thing that you find that people are leaving sometimes even without jobs because they're just like, I don't see any meaning in this. So um, I think moving forward, uh, you know, the job is not just a job. The job has to have meaning. The job has to, um, you know, be something that I, I uh, is purposeful. Right. To, and I think that's where people are heading to wherever you're from, whether you're in, you're in India, whether you're in Malaysia, whether you're in the US. Yeah. Very interesting perspectives there from Rajiv and Freda. With that, I'll, I'll move to the next question. And it essentially revolves around the fact that uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, these are, you know, catchphrases in the industry these days. But uh, different organizations define it very differently. Right. Right. So if there was this standard way how, you know, DEI should be approached, what could that be? How, how do you define this term in terms of, uh, you know, a standard that, you know, this is enough diversity for me or this is enough inclusion? How right. do you uh, measure that? Having worked in organizations, what they've done, so years ago, I used to work for, for IBM. And if they've always been about very diverse and inclusive things that I wasn't even aware of you, you know things that the company has come up with and at that one time I don't know if they still do it right now but they actually make a certain percentage that they are hiring people who are disabled right um, and so there was whether you and sometimes you say we don't want to put numbers but I think you do have to, like, you know, organizations, about 30% women are boards. You have to initially, when the numbers aren't there, I don't know when when enough is enough, but when you talk about diversity and inclusion, we, we, we can go into, you know, are we, uh, do we have enough, um, uh, you know, people from different backgrounds, that sort of thing, different races, you know, that, that goes into it. I always like to just talk about gender equality as in, do we have 50-50? Right. I mean, can we just start on that basis? Because a lot of organizations don't even have 50-50 yet. Right. So as much as we want to include all these other elements, step one, do we have 50-50? Um, if you look into politics, I think globally, we're, you know, just just we, it's not 50-50. If you look into uh, business uh, owners, it's not it's, I think 30, only 30 percent of women own businesses globally. Right. So that in itself is not equal already right so so when i would look at it I, I i know that there are so many aspects that sometimes we feel like oh my goodness you know we didn't think of this we didn't think of that but just start simply maybe just looking at gender quality first and then take it from there a little you know, take it from there uh, when you have the resources when you're able to yeah. i love uh, frida's answer there so one thing I would like to add um, to what she mentioned is it's also important to provide equal opportunity to people. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes we measure the outcome that, you know, it needs to be 50-50. Uh, but I think also important is to make sure that it's a level playing field. Um, and we know from hiring to promotion to uh, maybe compensation and benefits, it's not a level playing field, uh, right? So people don't get the same kind of opportunities. And so the outcomes are distorted, uh, right? So can we start with the process? and the input mechanism so that the outcome uh, is, you know, is all fair to everybody. So that's the only thing I would like to add to what uh, Frida just mentioned. The next question is, uh, do you think that an inclusive and equitable organization is in a position 
to perform better than its peers purely from a business point of view like is there a direct correlation and can we map that i'll, I'll address that uh, because in the uh, book clearing the digital blur i i usually talk about you in blur is unbounded innovation so today you will find uh, pfizer talking about going beyond the pill uh, british petroleum bp is saying let's go beyond the pump banks are saying let's go beyond a physical branch bank right so they are all going beyond and where are they all going right so uh, they are all going to a platform model right you will find banks are launching platforms uh, pharma companies are launching platforms and once you become a platform you become an ecosystem right and in an ecosystem it is really about building a community around your business and they say and this has happened quite consistently in the past as well when blackberry and apple had that competition many years ago apple won that contest why did that happen because blackberry blackberry was doubling down on their product right mm-hmm. uh, whereas apple built their app developer ecosystem so the ecosystem today is the superpower it is not a product product can be replicated uh, quite easily so if that is the reality in today's business how do you then operate in an ecosystem environment when you have diversity by default in an ecosystem mm-hmm. because you've opened yourself up it's not about your product your channels your customers you've essentially opened that world up and you are integrating with all kinds of players and with that one of the fundamental building blocks of mindsets that you need is diversity and inclusion without which you'll be a closed platform nobody wants right. to be part of your platform right? right so i think it is a business imperative for leaders to embrace uh, diversity and inclusion and um, if you think about the process of innovation as well right today when we are innovating we think in terms of design thinking right mm-hmm. and for that you need to start with the user this is user centric uh, innovation process and there you will find that there is diversity all around there there are women there are old people there are children you are innovating for everybody and so unless you have uh, uh, diversity in your thought process in your in your research process you will not get the product right mm-hmm. uh, right because we've gone beyond the industrial model of one size fits all today one right. size fits none if that is the operating principle diversity and inclusion become not just an hr tick in the box yeah it is actually an existential priority right uh this you know i i agree with you totally right i mean it's uh, you can go and do all your search and say you know uh research has shown you know how it has helped increase business by x number percent there, there's a lot of reports around that but very you know the whole idea is you're saying design thinking i think it was ge that came up with this mri machine right that was too expensive it didn't work and then through the this whole process of diversity they came up with a smaller cheaper version for the indian market right because you know india is so large and you know cost in terms of that and then that process just how and it was because understanding that the whole one size does not fit all that's where business innovation come about as well and that comes from not just seeing things differently i was interviewing this lady and she was saying uh, giving example of Kimberly Clark and how um they're talking about how the senior management the, the CEO was saying like if you so he did a little he did a little test he said uh, ask all the senior manager who do you have next in line and everyone put the the name in terms of who they have next in line and he looked at everybody he said all of you have been, all of them were men and he said all of your next in line are men now and if you don't start thinking about who else to include you are in kimberly club that sells nappies that sells all these things right if you are not understanding your target audience right and how will you be able to take your business further so really it makes business sense to have diversity and inclusion it's not it's not something fancy as you were saying a tick in the box it is good for business because you're opening up to new possibilities new thinking um you know we can go even into the generation right people of a different generation think differently you know ama would think differently from me having worked in organizations what they've done as so years ago I used to work for for IBM and I think if they've always been a very diverse and inclusive things that I wasn't even aware of you, you know things that the company has come up with and at that one time I don't know if they still do it right now but they actually make a certain percentage that they are hiring people who are disabled right um and so there was whether you and sometimes you say we don't want to put numbers but 
I think you do have to, like, you know, organizations, about 30% women on boards, you have to initially when the numbers aren't there. I don't know when, when enough is enough, but when you talk about diversity inclusion, we, we, we can go into, you know, are we, uh, do we have enough, um, uh, you know, people from different backgrounds, that sort of thing, different races, you know, that, that goes into it. I always like to just talk about gender equality as in, do we have 50-50? Right. I mean, can we just start on that basis? Because a lot of organizations don't even have 50-50 yet. Right. So as much as we want to include all these other elements, step one, do we have 50-50? Um, if you look into politics, I think globally, we're, you know, just just we, it's not 50-50. If you look into uh, business uh, owners, it's not it's, I think 30, but only 30 percent of women own businesses globally. Right. So that in itself is not equal already. Right. So, so when I would look at it, I, I, I know that there are so many aspects that sometimes we feel like, oh my goodness, you know, we didn't think of this, we didn't think of that. But just start simply maybe just looking at gender quality first and then take it from there a little, take it from there uh, when you have the resources, when you're able to. Yeah. And that uh, gets me to my next question and which again deals with another major challenge in the way of uh, establishing a positive work culture and that is the presence of uh, biases and mostly unconscious biases which we are not aware of when we are dealing with teams or individuals. So how can we recognize, first of all, these uh, biases and how can we effectively manage them so they don't intervene in our operations and our decision making? Okay, Reda, you want to go okay. I, I've, I've got uh, some, some uh, thoughts around it and I think it's when upon hiring Right, you have that's that first level, right? Are we hiring? Um, you know that the whole, you know how like this. I don't. I'm sure you have in, in India the voice, right? Where you you don't see the person's face and you just look at the credentials. And, and I think that's the first part. Preferably not even putting your. I know it's different in different countries by different you know laws. But even if you, if possible, don't put gender, don't put age, don't put all these other things, right? And so you are hiring that first level of filtration. That's the first point, right? The other way. I I look at it is also what happens it gets trapped is during middle management to senior management and you find that a lot of women uh, sort of leave during middle management because they're going to have children they're going to have things so what can you do at that level so that you retain them uh, maybe making the work environment more uh, inclusive at that time before they you know maybe before the kids grow up or whatever it is right I think this is where societal expectations of what a woman and a man does it the topic for another day. I think that's also when you recognize the, the things can drop off. Now, the whole idea about unconscious bias, there's so many examples of unconscious bias. Uh, and maybe you want to read up on when you have your unconscious bias. And I'll give an example of how uh, women, because you're uh, unconscious bias, it could be two women, right, uh, talking about another lady who would be suitable for a job. And we both with very good intentions says, you know, I don't think Mina will want to work. She just had a baby. So we're not even checking with Mina whether she wants to have a, take the job. You know, these two women in their own biases have already decided for her that she doesn't want the job because she just had a baby, right? So this is like with a good intentions, not knowing what your unconscious bias is. So I mean, I think there the ways. I'm sure people like Noscape will have their ways to 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 make sure that and 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 to make sure that you can try to have your unconscious bias as much as possible. I'll tell you something, right? That I said as well, and, and maybe I'll, I'll give you an example. I was just talking to someone about this lady, and then we say, oh yeah, you know, uh, she, she and this is this. I don't think she needs a job. I said, husband's rich. This is me, not too long ago, saying that. I was like, whoa, what's it got to do with anything, right? First of all, uh, would I say that of a man, right? And so what if her husband's rich or she's good at what she does, right? I mean, so this is where, ooh, you know, you catch yourself saying things that are just uh, not so fair. That's my unconscious bias coming in. So, you know, you, you sometimes you're aware enough to watch it, but then I think read out about it, understand, talk to a lot more people and see, do I have these biases? And I think we're always going to have these biases. And so we have to uh, keep track of ourselves. Rajiv, your take on this? Yeah, so uh, the problem with unconscious biases is uh, some of them are unconscious. Uh, we, we are uh, able to spot this when others demonstrate it. It's yeah. a lot harder when you have to catch yourself. And Frida, kudos to you, you were able to catch yourself. That only tells me that, you know, you're aware of this idea. 
uh, mm. you are able to catch yourself and 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 and, and uh, course correct um, right but that's not the same with a lot of people right because right. Um, awareness levels are poor and end of the day why is it unconscious it is because of the programming that we have gone through uh, mm. our genetic programming and the social conditioning that we have gone through over the years some things seem normal this yeah. is how it's supposed to be why are you challenging this right is the attitude we bring to many things for uh, for example uh, women in technology mm-hmm. uh, and, and so uh, somehow it feels odd uh, for us to picture um, a, a woman in a technology based role and that needs to be challenged and, yes. and it's not the case you know a lot of women in science and technology as well mm-hmm. similarly when you think of a nurse you're probably thinking of a woman right while there are male yeah. nurses uh, uh, there right so some of these are um, elements of conditioning that we have gone through and we fall prey to it next time when we mm-hmm. have to hire somebody uh, let's say a nurse you're thinking mm-hmm. of a female or a right. programmer you're all constantly thinking of a male right so we fall prey to this so uh, what are the ways of overcoming it i think it is a lot of awareness um, right that, that is the ultimate antidote the more we are able to have a conversation around this um, and in a safe environment where you are able to call out each other's biases mm-hmm. when we are able to do that i think that goes a long way but uh, there is also something that an organization can do in its own ways setting up policies uh, maybe you know uh, pet friendly policies or um, uh, making sure that everybody gets equal opportunity those elements can also go a long way in resetting this norm what we think is uh, as normal mm-hmm. for people to follow can we challenge those and establish something different right organizations can definitely set up policies for that thank you so much rajiv and freda again for very insightful uh you know anecdotes and stories uh so that brings me back to the entire dei theme and whether or not it should be a function of the hr or do you see it in the larger leadership agenda and also for people who are not in the decision making uh positions how can they contribute in ensuring that the workplace is inclusive and diverse and equitable um yeah okay i'll 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 address that first but you know i don't i don't think it's definitely the work of hr alone right it's definitely uh when leaders even have to come out and say hey hr maybe we should introduce this that sort of thing um and definitely uh, i'll give you another example of a, a company that i work with i will not work for but work with on a project and this is uh, essentia right so some companies have started doing this and it's a uh, it's it was now made you know informed by hr but it probably would have started with a manager they have this thing called the panel pledge when people in uh, essentia are asked to speak uh, at an event they will look at the rest of the panelists and if it's just one gender they will say i will not participate unless another gender uh, uh, is represented in the panel session if it's all male where is the woman in this in in this lineup right so it it is beyond hr but even when they're outside this is what they're telling people we have a panel pledge within this company and we believe that you know the panelists should have both male and female representatives so it, it is something that um your 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 team leaders will look up to you you know so everybody should be on the lookout for it right before it becomes policy i work for an organization it's uh, that has given by law it is now 3 months but uh it, my my boss would give us 4 months and they've actually i don't know what's like in india but it's this also no law for paternity leave right and he said you know and we're in sme not dictated by hr i think and he says okay paternity uh will give them for 2 weeks right and it it's it's progressive because we don't have to do this right so ideally of course they look at sweden we got you know uh yeah uh you know uh, parental leave right but this is where individuals whether you're a large organization small where you can actually voice out and make a difference right and make those changes within rajiv your thoughts absolutely um i agree with tafid i also believe that this is um everybody's responsibility right in our own scheme of things i'm sure there are small things big things that we can do mm-hmm. uh, right for example if you are in a global team so uh, when we talk about inclusion uh, this could even be being sensitive to people's time zones 
Sometimes we set up meetings yes. Yes. that's convenient for us, uh, but not for the person on the other side of the globe. Yeah. Um, simple things like this, right? Checking with them: is this uh, time okay with you? Uh, right before we assume that okay, let's go with the majority, and and that's mm. inclusive, right? So simple things like this can be done by everyone, and I think everyone needs to uh, take this responsibility to make this uh, an inclusive place. It can't be just one person standing on the podium saying we all should. be inclusive right. it doesn't work that way uh, again the the point that uh, freda mentioned is even at board levels right so i think uh, having enough representation there uh, at, at the more senior most levels i think that's an important one uh, right so uh, essentially from a b- gender perspective you'll realize that there are a lot of women joining the workforce by the time they reach mid management is a heavy drop off that happens yeah. right and then the re entry into the workplace is not very seamless uh, right so that's mm. again something can we make it easier for people who um, take a career break and uh, making it easy for them to come back that's inclusion uh, right that's right. something that the team can do uh, to make that person feel welcome yeah and even if you're talking about career break right and it shouldn't be limited to women you know it should be also men yes. so then then you know maybe the men want to take on a more uh, a role at home rather because the wife is earning more or whatever right so it shouldn't be also just you know the assumption that is something that women do right yes. so there's 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 all these other things that we we can be aware of. absolutely that's great uh, i'll come to my last question because rajiv reminded me to be respectful towards each other's time and we are running a little short on time so we'll go to the last question uh, so rajiv and freda you both are strong believers in the power of training you have you know trained a lot of organizations and you know leaders around the world to what extent do you feel that right training can help organizations overcome challenges in creating a positive work culture that right you take this lesson <laughs> okay what <laughs> well, i think on the answer <laughs> so i i uh, firmly believe that you know learning is the the essentially the the tool for evolution mm. uh, right like it or not we are all learning uh, are we learning in the right direction and are we evolving in the right direction is the key question here so um, so i fundamentally believe in that and uh, and learning is essentially something that enables us to adapt to the changing environment when things around us change fast and we need to there's no other way but to learn and keep up and today's uh, you know challenges are very different from even what it was 5 years ago i'm not even talking about 5 mm. 5 years ago right uh, the ways of working how digital we have become issues around mental health uh, taking center stage because of um, many workplace practices um and uh, the fact that leadership looks very different today compared to even 3 mm. years ago right uh, and there's only one way to keep up uh, knowledge i think ultimately um, is the ultimate superpower it allows us to gain clarity uh, i don't like the word confidence that much confidence means there's something blind about mm. it whereas clarity means that you understood the the game you understood the scenario and you're operating then with greater confidence okay so learning is a great way uh to build uh, this new mindset that we need uh, for the changing world around us learning is the uh, really the the evolutionary mechanism we have to cope up with all the changes in the external world and today as i was saying uh the context has changed so much even compared to not 10 years 5 years ago even 3 years ago to what it is now things have changed a lot so the real question is are we going to take this as an opportunity and change ourselves inside out based on the situation we find ourselves in or are we going to complain about um, all these changes and get left behind i think that's really the the question so i believe in continuous learning continuous evolution um and uh, issues like diversity inclusion uh, these are really progressive ideas the we should em- embrace it because for the longest time the industrial world had some restrictions and these norms got established almost 100 years ago and we've been blindly following some of these things now with the digital age everybody is getting empowered everyone who has a phone in their hands or a smartphone in their hands can bring down governments today they can invent new things they can find new communities we are empowered so much as individuals but when we come to an organization things feel as if they are st- 
still in the industrial age, sometimes stone age as well, right? So, so it is time for us to change. And learning is a is a great bridge that will take us from the mindsets of the past to mindsets of the future. So, before Freda can answer that question on the power of training and how it can you know influence organizations, uh, Rajiv, uh, as an individual, if if an employee uh, feels he is subjected to bias on a regular period of time. everybody is not as vocal as the other person right a lot of people think that leaving this organization is the only solution to this so what's your take on that whether people should be really that vocal and discuss and is that the way uh, uh, around or how do they bring this up uh, to the management to their leaders to their uh, team managers yeah great question goes back to what we started with on psychological safety if i feel safe enough i'll voice my concerns and then the system responds the manager the leadership of the team um if they are sensitive enough to this they will do something to course correct uh, right but the starting point is that psychological safety where i feel okay that's one thing and there are certain practices that leaders can encourage and managers can encourage the ask me anything forums right uh, where it, this is radical candor you say whatever you have in your mind it's okay right you are able to do it um right that's you know those are simple things that can be done to instill the sense of confidence that this is a community we belong here and even a person and an individual's issue is a community's issue uh right and so nothing is big or small we will at least listen to each other and find solutions together i think that culture is very important yeah and and of course not of rajesh said everything correctly uh just just want to add this this person that I interviewed her name is uh, professor laura dana and she just wrote this book uh but anyway she talked about how when we talk about learning right it's not your soft skills hard skills but because both are really important you she talked about sharp skills and smart skills and and of course we need to um improve on our skills whatever it may be and those are your skills right but the the skills the the uh smart those are smart skills the sharp skills like negotiation that sort of thing right and you know there's nothing easy or soft about negotiation right or handling conflict right so these are the things that you continue how do, how does an organization continue to stay smart and stay sharp that's one thing but i think also innately that whole culture right whether you connect uh whether you have to remind people of culture uh what we're all studying what we're all about and know that you know every individual is going to be different but if we have a culture or a common goal or a vision then organize you know in our diversity we can still have that common goal that we're achieving in our in our own way right so um i think that's the the way forward that we we need to um I, i'm all about learning i you know other things that I've done over the years is all about that and I'm not dependent on my company in terms of what I want to learn right but uh do I continue to be loyal to my organization well if I'm still if I'm still committed to your what the company goals are if I'm still committed to the culture this is what well, this is what I'll be attracted to yeah? and I'll continue to work my organization because I'm so attracted to those things thank you so much rajiv and freda for that in enriching discussion and very uh, interesting insights that you have given us in the topic of uh, positive work culture and DEI but i'm not letting you go without that without some fun element to end this show and it is my favorite game in a way it's called first impressions right so freda i come to you first uh, so i'm assuming you guys are meeting each other for the first time so you would have some first impression about each other So based on your first impression of Rajiv if he was an international car brand what would he be and why Ooh international <laughs> car brand You know what I think uh I would say uh he is trustworthy uh someone you know reliable right and and it it would be a a, a Toyota or a Honda right and just just because you know that the the you know like you, the the toyotas are reliable right and even if you go and get it fixed right you know the parts are going to be there and you know that it won't cost you a bomb that reassurance i would say that that impression right you give me a reassurance awesome wow that's a great response uh rajiv i'll come to you next uh, based on your first impression of freda if she was a city which one would that be and why 
if she were a city um i i i think um, san francisco comes to my mind um a reason being you know it's um cosmopolitan very open minded right and also uh, in terms of social issues right uh, issues maybe relating to gender environment right you you'd find in the 1970s and 1980s california has enacted laws that today the rest of the world is catching up so ahead of its times and really well informed uh, right that's what i i i find in freda and and before the show started i was complimenting her on just the vibrant energy she has six books and and counting and the body of work she has got I, I, you know something about san francisco also reminds me of that vibrant energy so yeah it's is the red dress and the bridge that's right that too <laughs> golden gate bridge all right thank you rajiv and freda for your time it has definitely been an amazing start to this web series and we hope that we can only take it forward in a very positive and a very inspiring way from here thank all you so right. much for your time and for all our viewers out there we will come back with the next episode in the next month with another interesting guest with us thank you so much thank, thank you ma thank you rajiv thank you freda thank you thanks bye bye bye, bye.